This week on BuzzFeed Unsolved, we take a look into the Texarkana Phantom Killer, a case that has been referred to as, quote, the number one unsolved murder case in Texas history, end quote. Number one, baby. Yeah. I love it. I don't think they have like a big board in the Texas police station where they... <laughs> so you think they vote? Oh, it seems all relative, right? Yeah, I guess so. But, but they uh, seem pretty resolute about this guy being at the top of the heat. And it's a rowdy town, you'll see that. Is it really? It's a rowdy town. You've been there? No, I haven't been there, but I read it's a rowdy town. <laughs> Fun to read about a rowdy town. A rowdy town with two rowdy boys. Let's get into it. On February 22nd, 1946, in the Texas-Arkansas border town appropriately named Texarkana, Jimmy Hollis, 25, and Mary Jean Larry, 19, went on a date to the movies and began driving back to Mary Jean's home. On the way, they stopped their car on a quiet, unpaved road about 100 yards away from some houses in a residential neighborhood. That's what I like There you go. Hear. Yeah, you know what they're doing. How many, how many Here we go, wait, hang on. Oh. Oof. So wait, in this is this scenario, still funny? In this in, scenario it's where, 2019. When did this bit start? Like the God, this had to be like caveman times. You think like a Neanderthal looked at his other Neanderthal pals and went, <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, probably. It's a, one of the world's greatest bits. I feel like people don't do it enough nowadays because we take it for granted. Spread that around this year. You know, if you see your two <laughs> friends and you you think maybe they've been smooching behind your back, be like, I know what you guys are up to a little. I actually don't think your angle's catching it. I think we can still see your face a little bit, so you might have to turn. Is this like that? If I turn. It's like we're both making out. After about 10 minutes, a man walked up. As Mary Jean would later relate, quote, he wore a white mask over his head with cut out places for his eyes and mouth. He pointed a flashlight and pistol at us. He came up on the driver's side of the car and told Jimmy something like this, I don't want to kill you fellow, so do what I say. End quote. Both Jimmy and Mary Jean got out of the car. The assailant made Jimmy take off his pants, then hit him twice over the head, cracking Jimmy's skull and knocking him unconscious. The attacker then tried to sexually assault and rob Mary Jean. Oh, okay, it did, uh, yeah, it was good. It got a little rough. Yeah, it's a little rough. Interesting that he would go through the theatrics of wearing a, a, a mask. Yeah, anytime Very someone nice. wears a mask and it's a serial killer situation, you wonder, did they intend to maybe let them go? Because the only reason why, why you're wearing a mask is so that they can't then identify you later. Yeah, oh, that's true. If a killer approached me and he had a mask on, mm -hmm. I would feel a little bit better about my chances of surviving. Because if he walks up with a gun and his, like, you could just see his face, like I could see it's your face, I know that's probably the last thing I'm gonna see. And right now I actually thought of staring into those dead cold eyes. And if that's the last thing I see on this earth, I made some uh, mistakes along the way. Yeah, I'd say so. <laughs> Mary Jean pleaded with the attacker, telling him they didn't have any money. The attacker hit Mary Jean, knocking her to the ground. When she got up, the man told her to run. Mary Jean took off down the road, but was wearing high heels. The assailant quickly overtook her and hit her again, knocking her to the ground, where he began to abuse her. At this point, Jimmy struggled to his feet and managed to stop a passing car. It's thought the assailant saw the car lights and fled from Mary Jean. Both Jimmy and Mary Jean received medical treatment. Jimmy spent over 12 days recovering in the hospital. This guy did literally get his skull cracked mm -hmm. and still was able to get up and flag down another car, which then saved their lives. Um, yeah. Good for Jimmy. I mean, it could just be like a fracture, right? I don't know how skulls really work. From what I read, it was a pretty bad, pretty severe crack. Mm. From the description, she thought that he had shot him. That's how loud the cracking noise was, Ooh. which is not good. So, 0 for 2. Yeah, 0 for 2. But this, as you'll see, would be just the first of his... Uh, attacks. In the mid 40s, Texarkana was a relatively violent place. Killings, robberies, and other crimes were very common. It might make sense then, while the attack on Jimmy and Mary Jean was brutal, the community didn't pay it much attention until another attack occurred a month later. This one fatal. Yeah, I mean, it must be a, an upsetting place if a masked man trying to assault two people is just passing news. Yeah. Like, oh, did you hear about that, uh, the masked phantom who tried to murder two people? Oh, yeah. Hey, uh, let's go get a soda pop. <laughs> On the morning of March 24th, authorities found the bodies of 29-year-old Richard L. Griffin and 17-year-old Polly Ann Moore in a 1941 Oldsmobile on what was then known as a lover's lane. 
Both had been shot in the back of the head. Richard was found between the two front seats on his knees with his head in his hands. His pants pockets were inside out, thought to be the result of someone trying to rob him. Polly Ann was discovered face down in the back seat of the car, though there was evidence that suggested she may have been murdered on a blanket outside the car and placed there later. The couple had last been seen around 10 p.m. the night before, eating dinner with Richard's sister. They had been shot with what was thought to have been a Colt 32 caliber pistol, and any footprints that would have been around the car had been washed away throughout the day. We gotta give kids places to make out. Now, that's unfortunately most of these serial killer cases happen in a lover's lane scenario. I, that's what I'm saying. We gotta give them a well-lit area that is central to a town's location. Maybe some water vending machines nearby. Oh yeah. Yeah, some yeah. soda pops, some yeah. sprees, whatever, yeah. you know? Uh, just a place with a bunch of, well, I probably don't want to bring hammocks into the equation because you know, smooching might elevate, but. Um, that is true. Also, a hammock would be really hard to escape if a serial killer did come up to you while you were smooching in a well, hammock. Sure. It's impossible. You're, you're in a, you're, it's just a murder bag. You're, you're trapped in a little net. Yeah, you're like in a little, like, a little spider net. Though there weren't many clues for authorities to go off of, Three days after the killings, at least 50 people had been asked about the murder and over 100 false leads had been investigated. While this attack ending in the murder of a young couple turned more heads than the first assault, the community still believed these events to be isolated incidents. Three weeks later, their indifference would change into a frenzy of fear. On April 14th, authorities found the bodies of 15-year-old Betty Jo Booker and 16-year-old Paul Martin. The previous night, the two teens had attended a band performance at the Veterans of Foreign Wars Club, where Betty Jo played alto saxophone. They were also seen leaving the dance around 1.30 in the morning. Paul had been shot four times and was discovered in a rural area on North Park Road. Betty Jo had been raped and shot twice. Her body was found up in the woods about a mile away. So escalating, getting worse. Getting worse, he's getting a little more bold. One thing you can note though, because you always see the trends of these serial killers. Yeah. All of these were couples. Interesting. Both had been shot with a 32 caliber Colt, the same weapon thought to be used in the previous attack. This being the third attack in less than two months, now with four young people dead, the community was finally paying attention and they were panicked. When their husbands and fathers were away for work, women and children would move into the aptly named Hotel Grimm in downtown Texarkana. Sort of like a staycation. Uh, no, it's not like a staycation. It's more like a people around us are getting murdered. Let's all huddle together under the roof of a place named the Hotel Grimm. Well, clearly it's a popular establishment and if everybody trusts them, they're going there as a, a place of refuge. I suppose. Maybe stop being so uh, uh, judgy of these. The thing is, maybe I just don't country. have the insight that you have because this town, as I said, was a rowdy town. They even called it Little Chicago. And as we all know, that's where you hail from. Murder, I hail from Big Chicago. Murder, big, big, murder big Town, Chicago. USA. Okay, well, we, you know, there's some uh, big, big issues there. <laughs> Others bought guns and crafted homemade security systems from kitchenware and wire around their homes. Typically bustling streets went quiet. The Texarkana Gazette named the attacker the Phantom Killer. And it doesn't help that the, the press named him the Phantom Killer. They gave him a nickname. If you give someone a nickname, it's a compliment. It shouldn't, we shouldn't never be doing that for the serial killer. Don't puff killer. him up, don't puff yeah, him up. Because he probably read that in the paper next day and was like, that's got a ring to it. I'm gonna get some business cards printed. Yeah. Tillman Johnson, one of the lead investigators said, quote, we were constantly getting calls, mostly at night, about prowlers. People would call about any noise they heard at all, end quote. Everyone was afraid they would be the next victim of the phantom killer. Seems like a little bit of a stretch for a, really any Texan in the 1940s to say, uh, you know what, I, th I think I might need to buy a gun. <laughs> it is also fun that they're setting little Kevin McAllister booby traps I mean, around love the house. That. I think people perhaps undervalue booby traps. I don't think they're that practical in real life. They could be if you do it well. Who are you trying to booby trap on a regular basis? Your what? cat, your sweet Obi? He's a sweet boy. You're trying to booby trap that cat. No, I don't I want to do the opposite. I want to booby hug him. Booby hug him. I don't know what the term is. The, it's whatever definitely the opposite not that. Of a booby I'll trap is. I want to tell you the term I want to lay is not... down a, a path of rose petals, you know? Come this way, sir. I tell you what. You're you a go... sweet boy with a fuzzy face. I... I'll give you a little hug. 
On May 3rd, 37-year-old farmer Virgil Starks was listening to the radio when a 22 caliber round tore through his front porch window and hit him. His wife Katie left their bedroom to find Virgil bleeding in the living room. Katie went to call for help when the attacker shot her twice in the face. The bullets knocked some of her teeth out, but she survived. Ducking to avoid more shots, she made her way back to the bedroom as the attacker tried to break in through the kitchen window. Katie escaped out the front door with a bullet stuck under her tongue and trailing blood behind her. Katie made it to a nearby farmhouse where she was taken to the hospital and survived. Virgil, however, died. I don't like, uh, I don't like any mouth teeth stuff. Don't like it. No, you know, like when people get in fights and you can kind of see like the teeth coming like, and they're falling out of their mouth. I've got big issues with teeth, even if I'm sitting with someone who is taking a fork and eating and it scrapes against their teeth. Oh yeah, I don't like that either, or a drill. Ooh, We're also kind of like gl lightly glossing over the fact she that she got shot, shot in the, in the face. face twice. Yeah, that's worse than a fork scraping. An indication of the fear the Phantom Killer had instilled in the community. 20 to 30 police officers converged on the Starks farmhouse. Police tried to gather evidence and interview possible suspects and witnesses. According to Johnson, quote, people would stand out near the front of their homes and yell at you to identify yourself before you got too close. You had to identify yourself or you would get shot, end quote. Fair. So yeah, I mean, we're on high alert here. Yeah. If this was me, I'd have a double barrel shotgun pointed directly at the door at all times. You'd probably have to have shifts because I'd want someone out there at night too. I'm staying up day and night, I don't sleep. Well, then now, now you're setting yourself up to, for that. That's vulnerable because that's you're going to fall asleep. Maybe I'll take a nap. Yeah, take a nap. I'll take a nap, and then hey, I'll, I'll let's do in. shifts. You're right. Yeah. Shifts are right. Shifts are good. I, I wanted to be. I've never even shot a gun, so you've never shot a gun. No, you don't have to. I don't think I have to. Authorities followed bloody footprints left by the killer that went from the house across the highway, where they eventually lost the trail. While this incident exacerbated the fear of the phantom killer, it's possible this killing was done by someone else. The other attacks had targeted people younger than the Starks and had taken place in cars, not homes. In addition, Virgil was shot with a 22 caliber semi-automatic pistol, a different weapon than the 32 caliber used in the previous murders of Betty Jo and Paul. Still, this incident was included in the phantom investigation as panic swept the area. Authorities took to dressing as young couples in an effort to lure the murderer, but it appeared the phantom was done. Two months later, with no more phantom murders, the community's fear began to decrease and life started to get back to normal. No one was ever found guilty of the murders. Backtrack just a bit. About the dressing up? Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, I thought so. I'm yeah, imagining an old Texan man with a large bushy mustache. I guess like a, <laughs> like a chubby Sam Elliott, a cop hat on, a white t-shirt, pack of cigarettes rolled up in it. You're imagining a clearly adult, burly police officer exactly trying to right. look like a 16 year old boy. A hundred percent. And it's hilarious. Yes. And next to him, also an adult male. <laughs> With a big old mustache yeah, and a wig like, on. Sort of like <laughs> just maybe yeah. pretending to make out. Or maybe actually making out. Or pre recorded like, noises of smooching noises. Oh, like a, lot. Like a Ferris Bueller situation. Just yeah. sort of. Like... Well, that's like cartoon kissing. No one sounds like that when they're kissing. <laughs> With that, it's time to look into possible theories behind the Texarkana phantom murders, of which there are basically only two. The first theory is H.B. Duty Tennyson, a college student who confessed to some of the killings in a note left behind after he killed himself. According to a newspaper from the day of his death, a sheriff reportedly said the note read, quote, why did I take my own life? Well, when you committed two double murders, you would too. Yes, I did kill Betty Jo Booker and Paul Martin in the city park that night and killed Mr. Stark and tried to get Mrs. Stark, end quote. According to Duty's cousin, forensic psychiatrist, Dr. John Tennyson, Duty had connections to all of the victims. He was allegedly an usher at the theater where some victims of the attacks had seen movies before their deaths and had been in the same high school band as Betty Jo. According to Dr. Tennyson, one of Duty's friends lived under the same roof as the sister of Katie Starks. All right. So he had some connections to some of the victims. Mm -hmm. But I will note that the sources when it came to that note in particular were shaky at best. It was just him. What do they save these things? Why is this hearsay? People want to have, answer me. <laughs> it's like that. People, people in the public want answers. There's this horrible thing happening in their town. They look to the authorities for answers and if they don't have them, there's outrage. So you need to have something to say. Interesting. So 
as a result, some, uh, maybe some shoddy reporting. But it is fairly convenient that he has all these connections to them. And... It is. He's a, he's a very interesting suspect, for sure. But for me, because there's that note and these connections, and yet he still wasn't indicted for the crimes, there must have been something that ruled him out outright. Yeah. Our other theory is 29-year-old Yuel Lee Swinney. Around the time of the attacks, Arkansas State Trooper Max Tackett observed that cars were reported stolen and later found abandoned whenever the Phantom Killer made an attack. Following this lead led police to stake out a downtown parking lot on June 28, 1946, where a stolen car was abandoned. This led to the arrest of 21-year-old Peggy Swinney, the new wife of one Yuel Lee Swinney. While in custody, Peggy gave many detailed statements explaining how her husband committed the murders of Betty Jo and Paul, though descriptions of her own involvement varied from statement to statement. On July 23rd, Peggy gave a statement saying that on April 13th, the day before the bodies of Betty Jo Booker and Paul Martin were found, she and UL parked at Spring Lake Park and drank some beers. According to her statement, UL left the car saying he had to, quote, take a leak. End quote. Peggy said, quote, he was gone from the car about one hour when I heard something that sounded like two gunshots. It was just getting daylight when he came back to the car and started driving out of the park at a rapid rate of speed. When he came back to the car, I saw that his clothes were wet up to his knees and damp on up to his waist. End quote. She says that her boyfriend steps out of the car to go, go pee. Yep. And then he takes a long time, comes back. And when he comes back, he's very rushed. She's heard he's driving, gunshots. She's heard gunshots. He's driving very fast. He's wet. Mm -hmm. Not because of the pee, I imagine, because he went through a creek or something. It's near a lake, so. It's near a lake. Washing off the blood? She does seem to have a fair amount of details. She does, and there's one detail that she has that is very interesting that she knows, and we'll get to that in a second. Okay. On July 24th, Peggy gave another statement. In this one, she said Yuel had said, quote, he was going out to the park to rob someone, end quote. Peggy said she went with Yuel to Paul Martin's car, where Yuel pointed a gun at the young couple and told them to get out of the car. Peggy said that she refused to search the teenagers, which angered Yuel, and he shot Martin twice. Peggy then allegedly held Betty Jo in place while Yuel got his car. He drove it back, made both girls get into the car, drove west, turned around and shot Paul two more times, as he had apparently been able to get up and move after the first two shots. He took Betty Jo into the woods while Peggy waited in the car. When Yuel returned, he told Peggy he had tried to, quote, get some, end quote, with a young girl, and then shot her after she refused. Wait, so this is the same attack, but a different story? So she gave multiple statements about this day that they were at the lake. One version, she says he left and came back. This version, she says, she was well involved with. She was this. somewhat involved, and she she said that he was going to go rob these people. I see. While Peggy's story shifted, she crucially told police information that only someone who had been at the scene of the crime would have known. For instance, Peggy mentioned how Paul's date book was thrown into some bushes, a fact that only Bowie County Sheriff W. H. Bill Presley knew at the time, as he had been the one who'd found the book. So it sounds like she knows what she's talking about. Okay, so there's two scenarios, right? She was there when the murder happened, or... She happened upon it? She happened upon it while they were at the lake, found these bodies, saw that there was that in the bush, and then ran away, and then realized later, maybe they'll find out I was there. Yeah. But I will say that if scenario two was true, it does not make a bit of sense for her to be like, yeah, we decided we were going to rob them. Oh, they might find out I was there. I know what. I'll tell them we killed them. <laughs> yeah, I, make any sense. I know. I'll tell them he killed them, and I thought about a robbery. And I just kind of was But there. I wasn't down. UL was arrested at the Arkansas Motor Coach bus station as he arrived back from Atlanta, where he had attempted to sell a stolen car. While his wife was willing to talk to investigators, UL was not. Critically, while Peggy did give statements to investigators, she could not be forced to testify against UL, as they had gotten married mere hours before police arrested her. I'm having a hard time taking a temperature on these two. <laughs> Do they love each other? I well, don't clearly know. Clearly not, because she's she's, you know, ratting them out, but that also could be self-preservation. She could have been involved. Do they get off on this? That's what I was saying. Like a weird Bonnie and Clyde. But Bonnie and Clyde stuck together. Bonnie wasn't like, hey, you gotta check out this Clyde guy. 
Yuel was taken to Little Rock for a truth serum shot, but he was given too much, which caused him to pass out. Investigator Tillman Johnson said, quote, I think that if we had just kept him here in Texarkana and kept questioning him, we would have gotten the truth out of him eventually. End quote. Or the truth serum is not real. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we've come across this, this uh, very elusive <laughs> truth serum. Thing. We've in, looked it up. In most of these cases, I mean, whatever it is, apparently you could overdose on it. You could take too much <laughs> truth serum, too much serum. Too much serum, man. <laughs> oh. yeah. So you're bringing in this uh, quack doctor who's like, he's, just, oh, he's not telling the truth, give him more. Okay, let me inject him with my lemon juice cocktail. I'll tell him, make him. Looking pretty woozy, Doc. Piggy was imprisoned for her own involvement in the car theft, but eventually released. Yuel was sentenced to life in state prison for being a habitual criminal after the auto theft charge, but was released on parole in 1973 when the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals decided that he didn't have adequate representation on a car theft charge from 1941. Yuel died in a nursing home in Dallas in 1994. Crazy to think you can kill five people in the 1940s and then live long enough to see Jurassic Park in theaters. <laughs> Thank you for Discuss that. some other things. <laughs> Thank you for that colorful it's perspective. Just crazy. I'm just trying to put into perspective the fact that this man so long ago committed these crimes and, and then he, and then he so saw, far into the future. And he saw the rise of industrial light and magic. Hi, Alan. They're wizards. <laughs> yeah, I don't really know how to wrap this one up because it's just kind of upsetting because I feel like this man got away with it. Or the other guy. Gotta say that. Or the other guy. But it does seem like this guy. <laughs> the Texarkana phantom murder stand out as managing to stoke a frenzy of fear in a community that had been numbed to violent crime. As W.E. Atchison, a resident of the area who was 16 at the time of the attack said, quote, the big wonder for everyone back then was whether the killings were being done by someone who lived among us, and I still wonder who did it, end quote. Across four attacks, five people were shot to death, and three others were severely injured. As for who was responsible, that remains unsolved. I will say that since the, the, the time of the murders, the town really has leaned into it. The movie that was made about this was called The Town That Dreaded Sundown. I've heard of that. I didn't realize that that was about uh, that. I've never seen it, but the, yeah, the that's title. About, that's about the Texarkana Phantom Killer. Dang. Well, that I, I don't really know how to wrap this one up because it's sad. That's positive. Good. Here's a positive spin. Yeah, let's do it. What do you got? This made the town rally together. And they thought, like, maybe we got to stop being so violent with each other. That didn't happen, but eh. they certainly remember the murders. Well, then they, then they said, let's remember these murders. There Forever. it is. And I'm sure it's a lovely town. Yeah. I've never been. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll have to go sometime. Okay. We could watch the movie too. Yeah, you I'll know, just watch the, the movie. The other town that dreaded sundown. Yeah, we'll yeah. just watch the movie.